I, I'm at the Baylor College of Medicine, primarily as a, on the faculty as a professor of urology. I have a joint appointment with the Center for Space Medicine here at Baylor. Uh, I'm the chief of urology at the Mike Lee DeBakey VA Medical Center. And my training is in the area of urologic oncology. So that's what I do primarily. I'm currently the wing surgeon for the lead command uh, fleet logistics support wing. I've had assignments uh, as a flight surgeon uh, across the, the gamut uh, from uh, a Marine Corps light attack to uh, uh, Hornet squadrons, C 130 Herc squadrons. I, I spent 13 years as a NASA flight surgeon uh, with the Johnson Space Center and uh, as a crew surgeon for shuttle missions and for the International Space Station. Uh, most of the time when I was in theater, I was there as a flight surgeon. And, uh, and so my, most of my duty was supporting the air crew. My collateral duty when I was in Al-Assad, for example, was as an, uh, an ECMO, electronic countermeasure officer. And uh, I, I flew typically ECMO 2 or ECMO 3 and the Prowler, and I would run jamming pods or do comm between you know, spec ops and the aircraft during missions to uh, help, the, you know, the flight crew uh, coordinate our support of, of the ground operations. You, If somebody had a concern that they might have a prostate cancer, you would want to know that before you sent that person into a theater, combat theater, and then uh, evaluate it and deal with it prior to Sending them, a number of astronauts have had prostate cancer and have been operated on for prostate cancer and have suffered from prostate cancer. Uh, and we have been able to get crew members who had prostate cancer who were treated and were rendered NED with no evidence of disease uh, approved for space flight. And, and there are a couple of folks that have gone public with their uh, diagnosis. And so I'm not speaking out of turn and talking about them, but I've been involved with the diagnosis and, uh, and treatment of, of uh, several astronauts. Some of our Apollo astronauts uh, were some of the first uh, to be diagnosed and be treated. And then the Kelly twins, uh, Mark and Scott, uh, uh, have, have gone public. They've appeared at, at meetings like at the AUA, the American Geologic Association, and talked about their prostate cancer, but both were able to be um, uh, treated and then uh, uh, approved a, a waiver to go back into flight stack. So that's the success story. That the concern, however, is why have so many astronauts and why have so many aviators in general? Because both Mark and Scott were Navy naval aviators before they became astronauts. Why are so many getting prostate cancer? I think that's an extremely important question. I, I wish I knew the exact answer, but I can give you some theories and things we're working on. And we are engaged in a study uh, to look at some of the uh, molecular changes that might be present, what, what we call epigenetic effects of the military service that might be predisposing them to cancer. So you can talk about genetic effects, things that you're born with, and then things that might be developing in the way your genes express themselves. And we call those epigenetic effects that could uh, change your risk. We think there might be things that the individual military personnel are exposed to that would, would affect their gene expression and therefore be epigenetic changes. Things, for example, of <clears throat> methylation of their DNA, putting methyl groups on the, the backbone of your genetic code to change the way it's read. There are, are many other things like perhaps we're damaging the DNA, or we're damaging the cell membranes from these exposures. And then you say, well, what kind of exposure would, would do such a thing? Uh, for the aviators, we suspected it might be radiation related. So there could be radiation from what's captured in the Earth's geomagnetosphere from very high altitude flight. If you're flying in like a U-2 aircraft and you're going on very high altitude missions, you may be getting some trapped radiation exposure. If you're flying polar routes near the poles, like over the pole from, from northern United States over to Europe, we often go polar. And there you're going to get more of the auroral horns of the geomagnetosphere as the, the magnetic bands come down towards the pole. Uh, there's an area where the trapped radiation is much higher in density. In space flight, they fly through an area called the South Atlantic Anomaly that's below the 
geomagnetic where the geomagnetic uh, trapped radiation dips down closer to the surface of the planet and the spacecraft goes right through it. And that's another place where you could get exposed. There's also exposure on your uh, uh, aircraft platform, depending on what you fly in. For example, if you fly in the A-10 Warthog, you might have a round in your arsenal that is, you know, has depleted uranium in it. And depleted uranium, while much, much less radioactive than the original uranium, it's still mildly radioactive. And so it could be a source. We use a, an F-18 platform, electronic countermeasures platform called the Growler. And so those platforms, they put out a lot of electromagnetic radiation because they're actually designed to take out enemy radar capabilities or their communication capabilities. And so they put out a very strong signal and it's very directional and potentially <clears throat> some of that radiation may be uh, exposing the crew. Plus the radars themselves are fairly large uh, size radars, uh, especially in like the Eagle that goes way out and, and uh, it's got a lot of power. And so there's a lot of electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation that flight crews are exposed to as well. So one of the things we measured at NASA and compared it to military aviators was the incidence of cataracts in the eye. We see these lenticular opacities, so cloudiness of the lens of the eye that come from a specific type of radiation exposure. And they're much higher in astronauts than they are in military aviators, higher in military aviators than in civilian aviation crew and then higher in civilian aviation crew than the general public. So there's something about the flight environment that predisposes to cataracts, and we think that it's due to radiation. There's other sources that are chemical in nature. And we know that, uh, like in the aviation world, uh, some of these composites uh, shed cadmium. That's part of the uh, the composite structure of the vehicle uh, includes cadmium, which is a known carcinogen. There's a number of different solvents and cleaning solutions that are used for aircraft parts uh, that include maybe benzene, toluene, and some of these other aromatic hydrocarbons that could be a source of carcinogenesis. There is uh, exposures that weren't necessarily well characterized before we went into theater, but we learned about later. Uh, Dust and some of the the contents of the dust, like in Iraq especially. And then in Iraq, we had a, a big issue, and I think the same was probably true of some of the bases in Afghanistan, uh, with these big open burn pits. And we were burning everything that needed to be destroyed in those burn pits. And the, and the effluent, the smoke, was coming out of the burn pits and blowing across the base. And every day, there would be a large puff of smoke that the burn pit was operating that would, would envelop uh, al-Assad, depending on the wind conditions. And so I think all of those things potentially could be sources of epigenetic-induced carcinogenesis. Might there be sort of an intersection of all of those sources that one particular, you know, whether it's a a cadmium or, you know, perhaps non-ionizing and toxic radiation or something, individually, they may have limited to no effect, which is why people may deem them safe for for personnel, for people, but combined over and over periods of time, they become really instigators of, of cancer episodes. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and when I was at NASA, we used to talk a lot about <clears throat> stochastic versus deterministic effects. And so, you know, some things seem to have a threshold. So you get a certain dose and below that you're safe. But as soon as you get above that dose, then you pass the threshold and you're going to get a, an effect. And some things, we don't know exactly what the threshold is, but we think more is worse. And so we try to just keep it as low as we reasonably can. And I don't know that we have a clear indication of which of those effects may be stochastic and which ones are deterministic. Uh, But the idea that there may be some synergy, uh, some combinatorial uh, effect on epigenetics is probably a valid idea, and I think it deserves more attention. But it is hard to study because there's so many potential combinations of things. And how much do you know? How much of one versus the other, and how, and how much of this dose is 
is uh, below the safety threshold versus above the safety threshold versus something else, a burn pit smoke. I mean, they burn so many different things, everything from uniforms to body parts. I mean, it's like there's just a wide array of things that were burned in those burn pits. And so um, we don't even know what the chemical composition, it, it probably wasn't uniform. It probably was variable day to day on what was what was being produced, but you can be almost assured there there was some uh, aromatic hydrocarbons and some aliphatic hydrocarbons and probably uh, a number of other heavy metals that were liberated. And all of those things have potential carcinogenesis. And so if you add those exposures onto some of the more routine things, because it's not like your risk of cancer is zero if you don't have exposures, right? You know, our, our inherent risk of cancer across the board is somewhere between 20, 25% you know, over your lifetime that you're going to get cancer. And so what we're talking about is additive risk on top of the baseline risk. And the baseline risk is, is a combination of our genetics plus our environmental exposures. And that varies anything from our water source, the air we breathe, the food we eat. I mean, all of those pesticides in the environment, uh, there are so many things that can contribute to that. And that's why it's really <clears throat> challenging to tease out all of those exposures to those that are unique to the military. Does it matter where the source was in terms of treatment choices from day one forward? Well, what matters is the aggressiveness of the cancer. So we tend to try and characterize a man's prostate cancer with how likely it is to progress clinically in their lifetime. <clears throat> and and it, sometimes it depends on the age of the individual when they're diagnosed. And if there's somebody who's, say, 90 years old, and they, they have a terminal illness, and they're only going to live another year or two, uh, the urgency to treat their prostate cancer is extremely low, because the chance that the prostate cancer will affect their life is, is quite small. <clears throat> but if a man's 45 or 50, like some of our astronauts have been when they were diagnosed, <clears throat> and they uh, have a moderately or significantly aggressive cancer, the chances of them dying of their prostate cancer is quite high. <clears throat> and so those individuals need aggressive therapy or they could, because they have aggressive disease. So they have disease that could result in loss of life and loss of um, useful years of uh, service compared to someone who may be elderly, have other comorbidities, or have a very low aggressive prostate cancer low on the aggressive scale. And we call that the Gleason scoring or Gleason grade group. That kind of puts it into a risk bucket by scoring its appearance and the PSA level and some of the staging that we do. All of these things give us an indication of how aggressive the cancer is going to behave. And based on that, we prescribe therapy accordingly. And sometimes we just watch it. We do what's called watchful waiting or active surveillance if we think it's a relatively low aggressive uh, tumor, and we're not going to subject the individual, the man, to to side effects of therapy if if their risk from the cancer is relatively low. Uh, we're seeing less, you know, Gleason six and three plus four than we used to, and we're seeing a lot more, you know, the higher Gleason uh, scores or the higher grade group uh, than in the past. Uh, now, I, I do most of my time over at the VA, so. I am a little bit skewed from that standpoint, but uh, uh, what I'm hearing is the same is true in the, in the civilian side, in the private sector as well. Uh, they're seeing a lot more of the higher risk prostate cancer. And so there may be something else going on environmentally that uh, we have to worry about. But uh, I think that uh, uh, your, your point of uh, is a younger person an indication, if a younger person gets a cancer, is it more likely an indication that their exposure led to that? That's not always true. Uh, the men that have cancers in their family are more likely to have uh, cancer when they're younger because they had that genetic predisposition. So they're already kind of pre-wired towards cancer because of an inherited mutation, for example, or a defect in their, in their genetic structure that led to that. 
uh, reducing the disparity that black men face with uh, uh, versus white men. Prostate cancer in general world in the United States, at the very least, uh, kill, prostate cancer kills black men at 2.4 times the rate as white men. But within the VA system, within the military care, within active duty, within retired people getting their care on milit on bases in the United States, that disparity in terms of outcome, in terms of morbidity and just quality of care, that dissipates to where it's negligible at, at worst. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say irrelevant, diminished dram dramatically. So I think that you brought a point. There's clear disparity in outcomes currently in the African-American population versus either Asian or Latin or Caucasian American, European American individuals in our country and, and around the world for that matter. If you look at populations like the VA and uh, the uh, active duty, when they have equal access, that number diminishes dramatically. And in some cases, you can't see a statistical difference between them. Others that there's still a little bit of disparity <clears throat> that exists, but it may not be access related. Uh, three cheers for that. Uh, Captain Jones, thank you very much, and uh, welcome to our uh, one-day conference. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I think that uh, people have recognized that not only veterans have uh, specific you know, conditions that are unique to their service, but they have specific mm -hmm. contributions to make to society because of their experiences and things they can bring to the table, and they're, they're welcoming them in the, in the workplace. And so those are all good news stories that we can we can take from today's discussion.